All right, folks, welcome back. Um, so we're feeling pretty good about this. We're getting everything down. And I see that we have our friends down in Ventura County um, showing up as well. And um, we're just about to head off to our first workshop. And I want to introduce you to Mindy DeRohan. Mindy is the uh, conference chair. There she is waving at us. And, um, and uh, she gets the fun job today of being down in Ventura County while we're here in Sacramento. But she's done a lot of work for this. And so with that, I think she's going to do the introductions. Hello, Mindy. Good to see you. We're so excited to be here um, in Ventura County and be able to share parts of it with you guys virtually. Today we are at Howling's Group. It's a world-renowned tomato and cucumber greenhouse with facilities in the U.S. and Canada, but their base is here in Ventura. And Jamie Mack and Ernie is going to tell us a little bit more about what they do here and give us a little tour of their facility. Hello, um, I'm Jamie McInerney. I'm the brand manager here at Howling's. I've been here just over two years now. Um, and typically pre COVID, we'd be able to have this tour where we start at the office, we go through the greenhouses. We talk about all our sustainability faucets. Um, we end at the pack house and we get to try some samples in the office afterwards. Now that we're in this COVID era, we've really cut things down, um, not only to protect our employees, um, but to protect our crops because there are a lot of crop viruses that also occur when you have a lot of people going in the greenhouse. So we've kind of made a condensed tour here for you today. Um, luckily, we were able to capture some drone footage and some really nice B-roll to give you an idea of what it's like uh, pre-COVID. So if you want to roll that footage right now. California. Um, we're just inward of, of Ventura, so we don't get that uh, nice Ventura breeze. It's a hot day today, so apologize uh, if I sweat a little bit. Uh, but we're nestled right now in between a kind of odd unit. We don't have the most beautiful background, um, but it is a part of our sustainability efforts here at Howlings. Let me back up and start talking about our history and what made us become this sustainable company, and then I'll get into our surroundings here. So. We started as a floral greenhouse grower up in BC, which is just east of Vancouver, up in Canada. Um, and it was the early 70s. Um, our founder was kind of figuring out that the flower market is very volatile. Um, so his son suggested that we move into beefsteak tomatoes. Uh, so we did that. We were the first greenhouse with five acres of beefsteak tomatoes, which at the time in the 70s, was a huge deal. Nobody thought you needed that many acres of beefsteak tomatoes. We currently have over 200 acres of tomatoes and cucumbers. So it shows that that was really a great investment. Um, and one thing about when you're growing in Canada is there's uh, actual seasons. Uh, we don't see those that much in California. So our founder was looking at his greenhouse and thinking about the electricity he was using to really grow during the winter to promote light, to promote heat. And he thought, we're expanding. There's this large market that we have um, to fill. And we need to go somewhere that's really able to grow year round. So he took off down the coast, going through Oregon and Washington. Um, and in his head, he had planned on settling in San Diego, uh, which is also another great spot to grow. But when he got to Ventura County, he realized that we're already surrounded by agriculture. 
that's good in two reasons. One, it shows that it's a great place to grow. And two, it means that we have all the agricultural supplies that we need locally. So we're able to locally source stuff, cut down on our carbon footprint, um, and not have to truck in as many, as many boxes, as many fertilizers, as many plants. Um, so he settled here in Camarillo. During our first crop, we brought what was an identical greenhouse to our Canadian greenhouses. Um, and if you know anything about Canada, you know it snows. That means that there's a uh, freeze off, which is essentially when all the bugs die. Uh, here, we don't have that. And actually, if you wanna peer that way a little bit, we're surrounded by agriculture. We've got fields year round surrounding our entire facility. Um, so we brought that greenhouse down. These crops near us uh, had their first harvest and all the bugs that were kind of nestled in there decided to go straight into our greenhouses. Um, and that first crop was completely decimated. So we took a look at our greenhouses and said, okay, why don't we put some, um, uh, some essential, essentially um, barriers up between our openings, our windows and the greenhouse. So we got some nets from Holland, we brought them down, we put them in our greenhouses after a year, there was no UV protection on them. They completely disintegrated. The crops around us harvested. And once again, all the bugs came into our greenhouse. And that's what really kind of to turned us to becoming a more sustainable company to taking these um, problems that are occurring in agriculture and kind of finding a different solution to the ordinary. So we started here with 25 acres of tomatoes um, and now we have 125 acres all under glass. We have six different greenhouses. Um, two are the original type greenhouses we brought back from Canada, just with nets on them. Two are a little bit raised and have a little bit more protection. And two are what are called ultra clima greenhouses, um, which means they essentially have um, less openings, less windows, less vents for bugs and diseases to get in. Um, and we're controlling the humidity and the temperature um, via, um, uh, words are escaping me today, sorry. Um, but we're controlling the, the humidity and the temperature um, with air filled bags that we have going underneath what is right here in front of me. Unfortunately, we don't have a small size replica to show you, um, but it's really what helps us to become a greenhouse that doesn't have to rely on pesticides, that has a higher yield and that uh, can really grow year round. So when we had finished the 125 acres in California, we realized there was still a great market to keep expanding. Um, and what we did is we went to Mona, Utah. Now, for those of us that have been to Utah, we know that it snows there and we just gotten away from the snow in Canada. Uh, the big difference is that we had learned a lot from growing here in California. And what we did is um, build our greenhouses next to a um, natural gas power plant. So we're siphoning all that CO2 that comes off of that natural gas power plant um, into our greenhouses. So that's providing not only fertilization, but also heat. So we're able to grow in Utah in the middle of winter and provide fresh local tomatoes um, to everyone in Salt Lake and Provo um, and, and surrounding areas as far as um, Colorado and Nebraska. Um, so I'll get into a little bit more about how we grow here. And, and I can start with, um, we're growing in a drain, drain type system like this. So we're using all uh, drip irrigation. Um, if this were on, it would be dripping water into there. Um, and anything that the plant does not take up itself drips onto here and is collected. Uh, that's really important to us because we're not only able to uh, determine the levels of fertilizer that the plant took up. Say we put five parts nitrogen um, and five parts phosphorus. We can see, oh, the plant took up um, all five parts of nitrogen. Maybe we should add more of the next round, but it only took up two parts of phosphorus. So we're adding too much. We can cut back on that. We can read what the plant wants from us as well as capture all that stuff that the plant didn't take up, put it through our filtration center right here where it goes through um, sand layers, ozone layers, um, and really cleans itself out and then reuse that water and that fertilizer next time that we're watering our plants. That's, 
that helps us to cut down our carbon footprint because we're not bringing as much fertilizer in. It also means that we're using one sixth the water of what you would use in an average field that um, is like equal in acreage. While using one sixth of the water, we're growing 25, 24 times more of the product. Um, and I can talk about that in a minute, but it's essentially because instead of growing bushy, we're growing tall. We have these really long vines that are growing anywhere from 60 to 90 feet before the plant is done. And then um, essentially putting another plant in right after so that we're year round growing. Uh, in addition to our filtration unit, which saves us a bunch of not only uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but money. Uh, we have our solar panels, which are right over here. We have four acres of solar panels that was built. At the time that we were building them, solar panel technology was moving very fast. So when we finished the framework for these um, solar panels, the panels had already um, become smaller in size. And in the state of California, you're only allowed to create one megawatt worth of solar electricity at your business. So that's as much as we can fill our current uh, framework. If we were to fill it more, we'd create one megawatt, which more than one megawatt, which is not allowed. Um, so that's where we're stuck at for a very long time. We recently just um, worked on some STEM batteries. So in the next few months, we'll be able to fill in the rest of that framework and use that solar panels to uh, charge some batteries that we can then use around the site, uh, especially with rolling blackouts in California, it'll give us a chance to really make sure that all our facilities, all three pack houses, all six greenhouses, the office and the cooler are running 24 seven. Now I can get into a little bit about our growing technique here. Here is a very, very small replica of how we're growing in the greenhouse. These are two cucumber plants. If you zoom in here, you can see the small cucumber starting to grow. These are growing in what's called um, a ground coconut husk. So right here, that's just all ground coconut husk. It's not um, particularly nutrient, but it does um, hold water and roots very well. And that's why we use it. Uh, when we're done with this block, we're able to um, recycle it or co compost it rather. And you can see our plant here is growing in rock wool, which is kind of the same concept. Kind of looks like fiberglass when you rip it apart. Uh, but doesn't provide any of that itch there. And again, no nutrients. It's just really good water retention. It helps retain our roots really well. Um, so we found that that's kind of the best scenario for us to grow in. Here we're growing cucumbers and tomatoes. Um, tomatoes will grow much vinier than this. Um, so the cucumbers kind of spread out a little bit more. Uh, tomatoes are a little bit more succinct. And you'll see if you look up here, that they're all connected to a wire. So this is exactly how we grow in the greenhouse. Once this gets up to the top, which in the greenhouse is about nine feet, we'll take this and flip it like this and move it over one. And we'll do that all along the greenhouse so that these uh, vines start to grow in a J shape. That's the best way for us to be able to really keep those vines growing a long time without getting stunted, without getting too high in the greenhouse and getting too much humidity and heat and sunlight. Um, and it helps us become a year long process. It's also really great for labor because when you're picking the cucumbers and the tomatoes that are ripe and ready, they're always at hand level. So instead of having to crawl up a scissor lift or do some really back breaking labor, um, it's all pretty convenient. That's not to say that this isn't really hard labor. It's so humid in the greenhouse. Um, we have many precautions to make sure that our employees are getting the water and the rest and uh, the breaks that they need. And it is hard work, but at this point in time, we really don't have the robotics to start um, picking via robots. Um, so we're doing everything we can to make sure our employees are, are really doing the work in the best way that they can. Um, and that's why another reason that we're picking at that level. Um, so you'll also see the um, flowers here. Hey, Jamie, we have a question real quick. Yeah. How does the humidity affect the tomato growth? So typically you want it a little bit humid, humider than it is out here in California. Um, but because we've been getting these heat waves and jumping up to like 100 here in Camarillo, 
we're getting up to about 114 in the greenhouse. And when it's that humid, um, the small cucumbers will just start to fall off while the larger cucumbers will start to curve a little bit. Um, and then later on in their life cycle and their shelf life, we might start see them start to wilt sooner than we typically would. Um, so we're really facing those um, situations right now because of the heat waves. It usually lasts no longer than two weeks and then our plants will start to get back um, into their normal growth stages. Um, but as you can see, we have flowers on these plants, tiny ones. Um, and we can't go around shaking all 125 acres of our plants to make sure that they're fertilized. So we keep bumblebees inside of the greenhouses. Um, and that's where this box comes in. This is what a bumblebee hive looks like. There's a few different companies we buy from. BioBest is, just happens to be the box I have today. Um, so typically the hive will be in here. This is an emptied out one so that nobody gets stung. Um, and then there'll be a in and out right here that allows the bugs to come or the bees to come in and out except for the queen bee the hole will always be just small enough that the queen bee can't get out when the queen bee does get out that's when we know that the hive is done with its life cycle and the company will come and pick up the box because these hives are not local to california um we chose bumblebees over honeybees because they're typical typically for us the more loyal of the two um, honeybees will really try to escape any way they can and find something like a rose bush versus a cucumber plant. Whereas the bumblebees um, really just go about their business. We don't get many stings. Uh, our GM has been here over 10 years now um, and just got his first sting the other day. So um, we're really not seeing that much of an issue with, with stings. Um, and that's why we keep the bumblebees around. And they're really good pollinators. But because we have the bumblebees, um, we really have to be cautious with what we're doing in terms of pesticides. Um, the pesticides can't tell the difference between a bumblebee and a white fly. So we use a number of alternative techniques when it comes to, to spraying pesticides. For starters, if we were to go in the greenhouse right now, we'd all have hair nets on, we'd all have gloves on, we've had uh, booties on, and then uh, a full Howling's lab coat we'd walk through a solution that would clean our shoes. We'd use hand sanitizer on our hands. Uh, and then we'll walk through the door and we'll hit a bunch of blowback. And later when I open up the door to show you what the greenhouse looks like inside, you might hear a lot of that. Um, so that's just to keep any bugs from following you into the greenhouse, or if they're on your person, if you're going, uh, say you're the ag inspector and you're going from one farm to another, there's a lot of concern that you might bring something with you. That's our first step to prevent pests inside the greenhouse. Uh, our second would be to use some natural alternatives like cinnamon or peppermint oil. Um, those can really help to, to battle diseases. Um, and a lot of times, once a pest steps in peppermint, it doesn't really want to come back. And then our third is we use what are called good bios like this. This is essentially a bunch of uh, tiny parasitic wasps. We'll just attach them to the plant like this. Uh, those wasps will hatch and they'll go lay their eggs into the egg of a white fly. White fly is a bad bug in terms of the greenhouse. So the more good bugs we have, the better. Uh, that being said, we do have to have an, a, a uh, integrated pest management program that can really manage the good bugs and the bad bugs and keep them at an equal level. Because uh, if, if you have too many good bugs, again, you just still have too many bugs. And then our... Sorry, uh, this one would be for spider mite. Um, so this one you'd really just go around sprinkling on the greenhouse and it's the same concept. Um, it's a, a bug that will go in and parasitize the spider mite. You can actually, I don't know if you'll be able to see them. I don't know if you can zoom in on that, but you can see some of them in there. Nope. Okay. No worries. So when I talk about um, our sustainability and the fact that we have ultra clima greenhouses, that really stemmed from the fact that our first two crops were totally disintegrated. Um, and when we brought these solar panels and we really didn't get the result that we wanted, um, we really decided to become more self-sufficient as a company. So what we did is team up with uh, GE and create what's called a cogeneration engine. Um, which essentially uh, uses natural gas to create power, but at the same time, we siphon off all that CO2 and all that heat 
and pump it back into our greenhouses. So on site right now, we have three of them. We're curating 13.2 megawatts of electricity, which is enough to power the city of Oxnard. Um, and then anything that we use extra, we sell back to the grid. Uh, and that's essentially the same concept we took to Utah. Uh, we also have one in our BC facility. Uh, what I didn't mention at our BC facility um, is that we're not only growing cucumbers and tomatoes, but we're also propagating all of our plants. So we're really one of the only uh, seed to table uh, growers in North America, simply because uh, about 80% of what we propagate goes out to our competitors um, and they're growing the plants that we essentially um, brought up from seed. They actually come to us when they're about this size. So this plant has probably only been with us for about two weeks, um, but it really shows you the difference in how you grow and how that changes the flavor. So. For example, we get samples every Monday and we test the bricks level and the weight um, and really just the flavor profile. And from week to week, depending on how you're changing the salt or um, the water or the fertilizer, you can really start to taste the difference. Um, and as a company, we work closely with our retailers. We'll send out samples to our retailers every week. They'll taste those as well. They'll give us their feedback. Uh, we might grow a certain selection for them and then give them our feedback on how it's growing, um, whether it's really easy to pick, uh, whether we're seeing a lot just fall off or a lot split. Um, and then we're able to come to a decision together as a greenhouse grower and a retailer to what's going to work best in the market. Jamie, um, are you guys aiming to go organic at any point? So. Although we're very close um, because we're greenhouse and because we're using all those alternative methods, um, because of our experience coming to California, it's not something that we're really, re pesticides aren't something we're really willing to take out of our toolbox. Um, that being said, we have a partners in Mexico that we grow organic with um, and our fertilizer is not organic just because we saw that it, it was draining up uh, the drip irrigation a lot. Um, but we are um, planning on expanding. We uh, have about 60 more acres worth of land that we can expand in Utah. We now have facilities uh, in Nogales, Arizona, where we're packing, um, and that takes a little bit of the labor off California. Some of the big constraints with growing in California is the price of electricity, um, the price of building, and then the price of labor. So mitigating those to Arizona and Utah is a way that we've been able to kind of keep afloat uh, and then we, we've said this before, every uh, virtual tour that we've had here, we've been lucky enough to do really well during COVID. Um, at home cooking has really skyrocketed and because of that, uh, so has the uh, volume of tomatoes. Unfortunately, we can't just snap and turn up the production in our greenhouse. It really takes some time. Uh, but we've been lucky enough to keep supplying our retailers to gather more retailers as we've been going. Um, and that really puts us in a good position to keep growing on in the next year. Uh, that's all I have right here. If we have any pertinent questions to this, we can take those now, but otherwise we'll start walking down to the greenhouse and open up the doors to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Does, um, I think we just have one more question so far, or a few more are coming in, but does a household water softener affect tomato growth at all? I would have to ask our growers about that one. Um, they're very particular to what is in the water though. So I would imagine that because it's usually um, pretty high in salt that it would affect the flavor. However, the more salt you're putting in the tomato, the higher the flavor, um, the lower the yield. Okay. And then how are you thinking about the future of packaging as California continues to phase out oil-based plastics? Oh, awesome. This question is right <laughs> up my alley. Uh, so as a brand manager, I'm the one who kind of makes decisions in all of the packaging. Uh, and I can't believe I didn't mess mess mention this because it's a huge launch that we started this week, but um, we're actually part of what's called Free the Cucumber or um, Goodbye Plastic Hello Healthy Planet. We've teamed up with a company in Santa Barbara called Appeal um, that's really <coughs> working in making technology solutions for ag. So what Appeal does is create a plant-based solution from the leaves uh, and stems and seeds of a plant all out of lipids and then coats it to um, whatever vegetable or fruit that they're looking at and that gives it a longer shelf life. Um, so this has been really great with avocados. You know, when you go to the store 
and you're picking avocados that are too ripe and then you can't finish them in time, or you're picking three avocados that are just not ripe yet, but then they all ripen at the same time and you can't finish them. Um, this has been great in stores. It's in Kroger's already. Um, they've also worked with citrus, finger limes, um, asparagus, but this is really the first endeavor that we've used this technology to get out of plastic. So this cucumber here will grow to be about this big. It's what's called a long English cucumber. What makes it different from your average field cucumber is that it has a really thin skin. What's better about that is that you don't have to peel a cucumber and you can eat the skin. It's not going to be super bitter. What's worse about that is that because the skin is so thin, you're basically going to have to wrap it in plastic to keep it from um, spoiling in a matter of three days. It'll start to lose waters really quickly. So now that we're able to take this technology that's a plant-based peel, apply it to our cucumbers, we're actually saving about 3.2 million water bottles worth of plastic per year just here in California. So if we applied that to our other facilities where we're growing cucumbers, if we applied that to even other growers, which is the main goal, we'd really be saving quite a bit of plastic. Um, so that's been one thing that I've been working on for almost a year now that we've seen launched this week. Um, other endeavors, we've switched to top seal instead of a clamshell. The difference being clamshell, you pop open like this. Top seal, you kind of peel back. Um, that saves about 35% of plastic. And we'll see uh, coming up in the future here, we're launching a paperboard top seal, which means it's basically made out of paper, but you can still top seal it so you're not really wrapping it in plastic. Uh, if you're avid Trader Joe shoppers, you might have seen our product in a small paperboard that's then wrapped in plastic. That'll be the difference. It'll save about 30% more plastic on top of that. From a clamshell, it'll save about 90% of plastic. So we're really invested in, in moving forward in those sustainability initiatives. Um, okay, so we did have a question about, like, why are we not finding your produce in our local stores like Trader Joe's? So do you guys have a plan? Yeah, so... Uh, I guess it depends where you're from. Yeah. Um, if you're local to this area, you'll find us in Trader Joe's, um, Vons, Costco, Sam's Club. Um, up north, again, would be Trader Joe's. We might be under the Trader Joe's label, um, which is their private label. Um, Costco, Sam's Club, uh, Rayleigh's. Um, oh, wow. But it's... it's you might not find our whole breadth of projects, but a mix. We might have tomatoes at one place, bell peppers at another place, cucumbers at another place, and that's just kind of how the cookie crumbles. And how many quantities do you guys grow here? Um, at this facility, we're growing just tomatoes and cucumbers. We have about three different types of cucumber, uh, a long English, a mini, and then a mini cocktail. And then as far as tomatoes, at one point, we were up to 60 different varieties, uh, but we've scaled back a little bit because we've realized um, where for example, with heirlooms, uh, they're uh, great to look at and great to picture, but people are really looking for a farmer's market type heirloom. Um, so we're growing about probably 20 different grapes and cherries, two tomatoes on the vine, and two different types of cocktail tomatoes here. And then I think you mentioned this, and then we can start walking. Um, what, how, how again do you keep the fruit development at picking height? Yeah, so um, when, the, when the plant first comes, we tie it up to this uh, string right here. And I don't see right here just with little rubber bands, and that's because the plant's still really small. When the, that vine starts to get a little bit bigger, we'll do um, what, are, what are plastic clippies. Um, and then when the plant is ready to move on, kind of, it's every week we move it. We just, oh, that's fallen. We, we flip it and move it about a foot that way. The plant will grow about a foot a week, so it'll start to take on this J shape as they follow them through. And then when we get to the end, we'll kind of curve it this way and it'll form all the way around. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's how we're able to keep everything at picking height. Uh, the plant will grow about a foot a week and by the time the fruit is ripe, it'll be right here at the bottom. Okay, do you want to start yeah. walking? Because I think one of the questions that we had was, what do you do with the imperfect produce? Sure. And well, I know that we that have, right over here. I know we have a part on our tour about that. So there's kind of two parts to this question. Um, with the produce that has fallen on the floor, that has splits, that maybe has been affected by a disease, um, that is just wildly too large because we missed it on the last pick and it grow, grew for a week, so it's just ginormous. Um, 
we will pick and bring over to this dump right here. It'll kind of all get mixed together. You'll see a lot of greens in there, which are calls, which are basically plants that are, or tomatoes that are never going to ripen. Um, and that's because they didn't get pollinated right. Um, local farmers in the area will pick this up to use for cattle feed, to use for compost. Um, and it helps us keep our, uh, our carbon footprint down essentially. But if you, like this one, you'd never see in a store. It's just far too large. Um, this one's too small and too curly. So, I mean, on one hand, it's great that we can use our local farmers to compost things. On another hand, you think about what a retailer will accept and it's just gotta be so perfect. So we've also teamed up with companies like Imperfect Produce. Um, they take the produce that is essentially deemed ugly and put it in a box and send it right to your door. They started out in San Francisco and have now spread to Dallas, New York, and a bunch of other facilities. Um, so we're able to supply them with the produce that just looks a little funny at, at, at about half the cost. Um, and that keeps both produce moving along. It also helps families that are maybe a little bit more low income to get fresh fruits and vegetables in their life. And then the last thing that we do is we work with food banks very frequently um, for any produce that say uh, we had really good weather and we got double the cucumbers that we were expecting. Um, we might donate some of that to food banks. We work with a company called Totally Local VC. Um, during this pandemic, we've especially worked with Sea Ag. Yeah, they're doing a workshop a right after you. Yeah, um, so it's a really a give and take. Um, sometimes we'll be really tight on product and we're not able to do it, but any time that we've really got a surplus, um, we'll make the best to, to make those donations. And how many pounds of produce do you guys produce each year? So out of this facility, we're producing about 60, 60 million pounds of produce per year. Sorry, I always have to switch it from kilograms to produce or to pounds. Yeah. So 60 million pounds per year. Uh, 60 million pounds per year out of Camarillo. And that'll be a mix of cucumbers and tomatoes. And then what about, do you know the number total of all of your facilities? Um, it would be around somewhere around 100 million. Okay. Our other facilities are a bit smaller than our Camarillo facility. And can you talk about the technology that's involved in your greenhouses? Sure. So um, you saw a lot with um, when I talked about the water filtration center. Um, we also have what are called power bees, which are vehicles that drive themselves. So they'll come into the uh, greenhouse. The harvesters will unload um, whatever they're picking onto those boxes. The power bee will turn around and go straight to our pack houses and then drop off all that produce. In the pack houses, we pretty much have automated lines and um, we really just have QC inspectors to make sure that the product that's brought in looks okay and is the proper weight. Um, and then even like to sticker those PLUs, which are the super annoying stickers that everyone hates sticking off their fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Um, it's all automated. It takes a picture of the box and then labels all the cucumbers. Okay. And this is one of your greenhouses that we're gonna see now? Yeah, so this is actually the first greenhouse we brought to Camarillo. Uh, growing inside, we have tomatoes on the vine. You'll see that as you go up the plant, they start to get greener and smaller. That's because the stuff at the top of the plant is the newest. The stuff at the old plant, at the bottom of the plant, is ready to pick. It's gonna get very loud when I open the door, so I'll open it. Uh, we'll take a look inside and then I'll close it for any questions.
Okay. Um, I think we had a few questions. Um, so what you see behind me is whitewash. That essentially helps keep the sun from burning the plants on the ends of the greenhouse. So what stage are the tomatoes in this greenhouse to, to, and how close are they to getting picked? Uh, those that you saw that were ripe red will probably be picked tomorrow. Okay. Um, it de we'll switch it up depending on where um, we're setting our produce. For the most part, we like to keep our produce on the West Coast because that means we can pick it red. So most of our customers um, are California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah, the surrounding states. Um, in Canada, it's mostly uh, Vancouver and then maybe some surrounding states uh, here in the U.S. Um, but we do have a customer in Alaska, so when we pick for Alaska, we'll pick just a little bit greener, um, and then um, it'll ripen on its way there. So these are probably about ready to pick next week. Um, they're pretty fresh. They've probably been growing for about six or seven weeks now because um, they haven't really quite made their way around the, the vines there. What are the black boxes in the greenhouse? Uh, those are just RPCs, so um, you essentially take them out, flip them, that's what you're packing the product in, Oh, and then it goes to a cardboard box before it gets to the store. Okay. And then what's the average height of the plants in the greenhouse? Um, I know? guess it depends if you're talking from the floor, because they're not growing on the floor. Yeah. Um, but they'll, but from the floor, they'd be about 9 to 11 feet. Um, and then before they're under their life, they'll grow anywhere from 60 to 90 feet. Let me let me just scroll through the chat and see if I missed anything. Yeah, no problem. What is the optimum growing temp for tomatoes? Uh, it's 37 Celsius, which I believe is 80 Fahrenheit or 81 Fahrenheit. Um, Ooh, I have one. So me. one person said, um, "I'm in Ventura County, but the Trader Joe's." Cucumbers or tomatoes never showed Ventura County. Is it labeled differently, or how can we show the kids that they're selecting locally grown produce? Sure. So, a Trader Joe's is particularly different because um, their each of their stores is allowed to present their produce however they want. So, I've been in one uh, down south that will say Howling's Ventura County, and I've been in other ones that don't. Um, so we're not allowed to quite dictate to tell them what it what's their produce. Um, our label itself does not have Ventura County on it. It will say either distributed by Howland Group Camarillo or packed by Howland Group Camarillo or grown and packed by Howland Group Camarillo. Um, so if you're local to Ventura County, um, I can I can help you out that way. I, I'll give Mindy my information to share with the group, and then you guys can reach out to me and, and I'll make sure to bring over some local product. Um, but it's really about looking at that distributed by or that grown by or that packed by and seeing the address there. So I saw um, some men on carts in there. Are they are they picking the tomatoes right now? Because one of the questions was, how are they harvested? Yeah, so that man right there would be harvesting. So basically, they are taking a cart with them down the line. Um, they're cutting them with scissors as a group of six, five to six. Um, that's really what the retailers prefer. Uh, putting them into an RPC or in Costco's case uh, directly into a four pound box and then taking them to the pack house where they're either packaged differently, um, sealed at the top or um, put into a cardboard box which then will go out to the retailers. Um, you... Other jobs in the greenhouse would be there's somebody that goes by and de-leafs which means that um, if you're looking in there right now at the bottom level where the cucumber or the tomatoes are um, you don't see many leaves. That's because somebody goes by and takes all the leaves at the bottom off. You don't really need any of the sugars or waters going to those leaves. Um, somebody will go by uh, once a week and make sure that they're moving the um, string at the top so the cucumber, so the tomatoes have room to to grow. Somebody will go by and check the flowers to make sure that the bees are pollinating right. You can typically tell by how many markings are on the flower. Um, somebody will go through the top and check all of the yellow tape that's up there to see if there's any big selection of bugs that tells us that there's a problem in that section. And uh, if it continued to grow, we'd clear out those few rows um, before we started, before we did our, our last stitch option, which would be to spray. Um, do you guys test the nutritional value of your produce? Um, it would really, we've done it once or twice before I was here at Howling's, um, just for a base level. Yeah. But I mean, it's gonna change depending on product, depending on 
what day you harvested it, depending on how it was harvested. Um, but we do we do tests for bricks, which is essentially sugar levels. So um, on a really small cherry or grape tomato, you might have a 12 bricks. Um, on a tomato on the vine, which is the ones in here, you might have a five or a six. Cocktails will be somewhere in the middle. Um, and then the basically the larger tomato, the lower the sugar level. Um, okay, so all, questions are just like flying in right now. <laughs> um, so what, um, my school's in the San Gabriel Valley. When is the best time to grow cute tomatoes? Sorry, cucumbers and tomatoes or? Tomatoes, okay. sorry. I said, started to say <laughs> cucumbers and then read it said tomatoes. Um, I'd have to look at how hot it gets there. Uh, I don't know that off the top of my head, but it would probably be fall. That's okay. essentially the, the best time to grow in most places. Do you grow your own seedlings or do you source them out? Uh, we grow our own seedlings. So we use a lot of different seed companies from um, Syngenta to Bayer to many others. Um, they'll provide us the seed. Sometimes we'll even do trials for them where we'll grow their seed and tell, tell them like what we're seeing. We actually have a, a trial in right now that's called the Yume tomato, which is a black cocktail tomato, which you can find at H-E-B if you live in Texas, <laughs> and um, Pavilions, which is usually in the SoCal area. Okay, yeah. Um, um, so I think we have a question about the local continuing on to the Trader Joe's. Um, if it says packed, in Cam packed from Camarillo, can we assume that it's also grown in Camarillo? Yes, packed by, you can assume that it's grown here. Distributed by might be, um, uh, if we're getting really big volumes that we can't fill, we have partner growers in Mexico that use the same standards as ours um, and we'll buy from them and then pack it either in our Nogales facility or have them pack it and then label it. Okay. Um, is it true that refrigeration ruins a tomato's flavor? Yes. Uh, that's probably one of the things that I forget to say most. In I always put them in my refrigerator. Uh, but uh, I would really like to work with an apple grower one day because apples want to tell you put them in the fridge and we want to tell them replace, switch your apples and your tomatoes essentially. Apples go in the fridge, tomatoes go on the counter, out of direct sunlight. When you put them in the fridge, they start to get mealy um, and that mushy flavor and they really just start to lose a lot of their texture and flavor. Okay. Um, how do pests and bugs get inside the greenhouse? Um, I mean, there's times where glass will break. Yeah. Um, that's a really simple one. When you open the door. Every time we open the door, yeah. Even so, like, these older ones, uh, from this angle, it's really terrible, but you can't see the vents at the top. Uh, actually, right through there, you can. Um, they can, sometimes are small enough to get through those. Uh, you think about our head grower. He's going to every single one of these greenhouses every day. If there's some bugs in one, you might bring them to another. And that's why we really have strict standards on changing your coat and depending on which greenhouse you're going in. So each one has a color that you're supposed to wear. And um, and really suiting up and, and using all those precautions. But I mean, it's not perfect and uh, we don't expect it to ever be perfect. So we're just doing the best we can. And then um, you said that you had been, you've been working here at Howlings for about two and a half years and you're the brand manager. Mm -hmm. Uh, but what's your background? Sure. Uh, so I actually grew up in Santa Paula, which is in Ventura County. I was in the FFA program at that high school. I raised cattle and sheep. Um, and I had just in the in my head, I knew I was going to be an ag teacher from the second that I started the FFA program. Uh, I went to Cal Poly Slow and started in the ag education program. And then my freshman year, I decided to get an internship. And I interned at a company called Limonera and totally fell in love with the produce world and realized that that's really where I wanted to be. Um, it had a bit of creativity, but it was still fun. Um, and it had lots of Excel, Excel sheets, which I, which I loved. Uh, so after college, I worked um, for an importer out in Long Beach called Vanguard Marketing. And we imported a lot of stone fruit from Chile. Um, from there, I was given the opportunity to teach uh, garden science at an elementary school. So I spent a year doing that. Um, and then my grandma got sick, so I came home to kind of help her out. Um, and when she, once she got the clear from cancer, I got the opportunity to work here. So it kind of all worked out. fell into place. Um, okay, so people are, they are so curious about tomatoes. <laughs> there are so many questions. Um, what is a cocktail tomato? A cocktail tomato is, okay, if you go to Trader Joe's, they call them a pearl tomato. Okay. If you go to Costco, they call them a Campari tomato. Those are just varieties, but overall it's called a cocktail cocktail tomato it's the one that's in between tov which is about that size 
a cocktail is about that size and a cherry is about that size. Okay. Um, so all the tomatoes on my plants are ripening together. Is it possible to stagger the ripening on a single plant? Um, on one, so as it's, it's hard to say because typically if you're growing in your garden, your, your plant's growing bushy like this. Um, so each one of those vines should ripen at close to the same time. Uh, like if you want to peek in here real quick and you look at that cluster right there, um, you see that red red tomato at the top is going to be the ripest. The least ripe on that cluster is going to be the one at the bottom. Um, but if you were if you want your whole plant to ripen separately, I would suggest just trimming black, back some of your plants um, before they start to get red. So you're getting less, but you're probably getting them at a staggered shift. Yeah, and then um, with the increase in temperature and climate change, is there any concern about thermal dormancy? Um, we're able to regulate our temperature a lot better than we would if we were just growing out in the field. Um, so it's always on the back of our mind, especially when we fill out, you know, all our greenhouse gas emissions, which is part of my job. It's something that we want to think about when we're going forward with initiatives. Um, but we're lucky enough that growing as a greenhouse, we know if we have the right electricity, we can essentially grow anywhere. Um, so, for example, we don't have as much of the heat problem when it, like, at this point in time in Utah, we're not having the heat problem yeah. like we are here. That's just based on seasons and stuff. Um, unfortunately, it's really hard to take humidity out of a greenhouse. That's really the biggest constraint. So we really haven't um, even looked into growing on the East Coast because we wouldn't even know how to go about um, removing that humidity. But it definitely is something that um, we work on as a company. My boss, David Bell, was actually just on a sustainability panel kind of discussing what we should look at going forward and how we as an industry can really get out of um, fossil fuels and and sticking to the norm. Um, so it is something that we look at, but it's not as concerning to us as it should be to field farmers because we really like don't have as much of an impact when compared to like the heat waves, um, flooding, um, any type of natural disasters. And then um, what kind of career opportunities are there at Howlings? Oh, I mean, uh, so I would imagine very many. Yeah, but, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we really have everything going on here from a whole team of IT to um, engineers and mechanics um, to just the harvesters that would be your everyday pickers and, and, and trimmers. Um, we actually have right now three finance interns. Um, one of them has just taken a full position at our company. Um, so it really I think people get stuck in this idea of ag is working outside and picking and gardening and it's really tough and it is really tough and it is year round and it's really no breaks but there are so many different aspects of ag from finance and it and marketing um, and working on projects like uh getting out of plastic cucumbers so i think there's really a place for everyone um who loves ag but also loves something else i think you can really find the mix of the two yeah. Um, okay. I don't know. Um, oh, we have one last question. Okay. What? Um, okay. Well, two more. On that note, how many employees are at Howlings? Um, during the winter time, we're at about 500. During the summertime, we're at about 800. And that's, um, you know, worldwide or that's just Camarillo? That's just Camarillo. Yeah. Okay. And then do you know company wide? Um, it's going to go up to about a uh, thousand one hundred. And okay. the, our other facilities are just much smaller. Yeah. That's crazy though. 800 people here. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, what's your favorite part of the job? Um, wow. That is a difficult one. I love running data analysis. I know it's super boring, um, but it really gives you an insight into, um, one, what's, what's growing, what people are really enjoying. And then you can look into why they're enjoying it and really get into the creative side or like, Oh, well, we just switched that packaging and that looks a certain way. And how is the uh, customer looking at it on the shelf and really getting into that aspect um, and then doing stuff like this. I mean, my background is in ag education. So being able to give tours and um, I know right now we're talking to teachers, but a lot of the times I get to talk to kids as well. And I think it's one way to really spread the word of agriculture. And that's not your typical 
I'm a farmer on a farm. Well, we're recording all of these sessions, so teachers could share them <laughs> with their students. Um, but we also want to know if, where there's a place that we can purchase your shirt. Sorry, what was that? Where people can purchase the shirt that you're wearing. Oh, these are actually these are <laughs> company shirts. Um, Super cute. Cool. Thank you. I designed these. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we don't we don't have an online site. Um, we do have some really big changes coming up in March, um, and you'll really see a whole revamp of our website. Um, and it's really going to take us, I think, to the next level of company. So coming in March, we might be able to start purchasing products online. Coming in March. Coming All right. March. <laughs> um, so do you guys have any type of program for schools here? So we work a lot with SEAG, who I know you're talking to later, um, which is more of an elementary school type program. Um, and they bring uh, food and, and teach kids about vegetables and fruits and, and how to prepare them. Um, in addition, uh, we had what was called Ventura County Farm Day with SEAG, where families could come um, one select Saturday of, of the year, tour our facilities. Um, we would bring our bug suppliers out. We'd bring a peel out. Uh, we'd have a whole farmer's market stand. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we're no longer able to participate in things like that. Um, so right now, we've really just been doing virtual tours. I've been on as many Zoom calls as I can um, in the classroom. And again, I'll share my information. If that's something that uh, you'd like to do, I'm yeah. happy to hop on a call. Um, but I mean, because of COVID, we've really put a halt to a lot of the programs that we had going initially. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> this has been um, really amazing. I think we've all learned so much about hydroponic um, and you know the, your guys' operation here with tomatoes and cucumbers. So thank you so much for yeah, no problem. giving us this virtual <laughs> tour and connecting with our teachers that have registered. Yeah, thanks. Thank, Thank you guys you. for coming out. <laughs> okay, folks. Um, thank you so much, Jamie. That was awesome. And, and the number of positive comments that you've brought in um, through the chat box, they're just all so impressive. And um, this was just really a super tour. Thanks so much. And I tell you, we have uh, teachers or Ag in the Classroom folks from both Utah and Arizona participating today. So I'm sure they enjoyed learning a little bit more of the Ag in their states as well. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Don't know what else to say, but we'd love to come back and tour another time. And meanwhile, uh, teachers, we will see you back promptly at two o'clock for session three and uh, have a nice quick break and we'll see you shortly. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Mindy.